Greetings, I'm Professor Brian Lazarus and in this segment I'm going to show you how to remember the rules of debits and credits so you will know how to prepare financial statements using these rules. So to help you out, I have put some information behind me here on the whiteboard. You can start off by writing out the accounting equation which you should all be familiar with assets equals liabilities plus shareholders equity. Also to help us understand these rules and remember them, I'm going to use a sample transaction that I've written at the bottom. The sample transaction is purchased office supplies on account. Again, the sample transaction in plain English is purchased office supplies on account. I use a four step uh, process to help us take this statement in plain English and convert it into the language of accounting, which is the language of debits and credits. So learning debits and credits is like learning a new language, where after you've mastered this section, you should be able to take any accounting transaction in plain English and convert that into debits and credits, which again is the language of accounting. So let's come back to our sample statement, purchased office supplies on account. The first step in our analytical process is to ask ourselves what specific accounts are affected. Again, the question is what specific accounts are affected. And the answer would be office supplies and accounts payable. Office supplies and accounts payable. Why not cash? Because the transaction said you are purchasing office supplies on account, which means you are purchasing these office supplies on credit. So if you're purchasing it on credit, there is no exchange of cash at this moment when you're making the purchase. The exchange of cash comes later when you make a payment and that's a separate transaction and we'll have a separate record keeping entry for that. So again, the two accounts affected are office supplies and accounts payable. The second step in the analysis is to ask yourself what categories or what families do these two accounts belong to? Again, what categories or what families do these two accounts belong to? And the answer is office supplies belongs to the asset family and accounts payable belongs to the liability family. Now the third step in our analysis would be take each of these accounts separately but we'll apply the same question and the question is does your office supplies account increase or decrease in value as a result of this transaction? Let me repeat, does your office supplies account increase or decrease as a result of this transaction. Let's assume this transaction is for $100 where you bought office supplies for $100. If that's the case, visualize this. You're walking into Office Depot, you are purchasing $100 of supplies, and you sign a piece of paper that says to Office Depot you will pay them later, and they have already done a prior credit check on you, and so you signing a piece of paper saying you will pay them later is accepted. Let's assume that for a moment. So if that's the case, you are leaving Office Depot now. So when you leave Office Depot, you have $100 of office supplies with you that you did not own 15 minutes ago before you entered Office Depot. So therefore, your office supplies account has increased by $100. Next, apply the same question to accounts payable. Has your accounts payable account increased or decreased as a result of purchasing $100 of office supplies on account. And as I just said before, you now owe $100 to Office Depot that you did not owe before. So therefore, your liability, your debt has increased by $100 and your debt is denoted by which account again? Accounts payable. So to summarize this last uh, step of the analysis here, the third step of the analysis, your office supplies increased by $100 and that's an asset, and your accounts payable liability also increased by $100. Now for the fourth and final step, where we take this transaction in plain English and we try to express it in debits and credits. To help us understand that, let's go back to the accounting equation. If you have an asset account increasing in value, as we do with office supplies in this transaction, that increase in the asset account is denoted by the word debit and then the asset account. So you'll see down here 
I have the word debit, DR for short, and then I have the account office supplies. So when you combine the word debit with any asset account, in this case debit office supplies, it means only one thing, and that is you're telling me that that office supplies account has increased in value. So coming back to the chart, I have shown about asset and arrow going up and the word DR, it's just a shorthand version of trying to remember this. Then let's look at the liabilities and the shareholders equity families. Because both these families are on the opposite side of the equation, they will work the opposite of the asset family. So let's take liabilities. When you have a transaction, again as, as we have here, where a liability account, like accounts payable, has increased in value, then that increase in the liability account is denoted by the word credit, CR for short. Remember, it's the opposite of the way the assets work, because when an asset increased in value, we said we would denote it by the word debit. So the liability is working the opposite. So one more time, when a liability account is increasing in value because of a transaction, the increase in the liability account is denoted by the word credit. So down here we have written CR credit accounts payable. So credit accounts payable means only one thing, and that is the accounts payable is increasing in value, in this case by $100. Shareholders equity works the same way as liabilities because as I said a few moments ago, both the liabilities and the shareholders equity accounts will work the same way for the purposes of the debit and credit rules. So if you have another transaction where a shareholders equity has increased in value, for instance where let's say your company has issued common stock, that's where your common stock account which is a shareholders equity account increases in value. So you would denote that increase by saying credit common stock. So that would mean your common stock account is going up in value. So I have just gone through the rules as it pertains to the increases for assets, liabilities and shareholders equity. Let me give you a few seconds now to digest this and then I'm going to start talking about the decreases. Now the decreases, the good news is that the decreases for each of these families will work just the opposite of the increases. So if you remember the increases, then the decreases are the opposite. So let's take assets. If you have another transaction, for instance, where an asset account is reducing, is decreasing in value, such as when you make a payment. When you make a payment, what happens to your cash asset account? It decreases, isn't it? So these decreases are denoted by the word credit and then the asset account. So if I said credit cash, then I am saying that the cash asset account is decreasing. And I have shown that here. So the credit for an asset means a decrease, just the opposite of the increase, which would be a debit to the asset account. Similarly, the decreases for, share, for uh, liabilities would be a debit and then the liability account. So if I said debit, accounts payable, I am saying to you that the accounts payable liability account is going down in value. And similarly, shareholders equity, a debit to a shareholders equity account will also signify a reduction in your shareholders equity account. So now we've talked about both the increases and we've talked about the decreases for these three families. Which three families? Assets, liabilities and equity. Well, we're not done yet. We're not done yet because, guess what? There's still two more families to talk about, revenues and expenses, okay? So with revenues, I have written revenues on the word revenues here on this side. That is to show you that the rules for revenues is the same as the rules for liabilities and equity. That's the purpose of writing the revenues on this side. And conversely, the rules for expenses are the same as assets, so I put it on the asset side. So that means when you have an increase in an asset in an uh, expense account, then that increase in the expense account is denoted by the word debit. So if you say debit rent expense, then you're telling me that 
the rent expense you're picking up or you're recording a new rent expense for this month. Uh, conversely, for the revenues, if you said credit fees earned, fees earned would be an example of a revenue account or sales would be an example of a revenue account. So if you said credit sales or credit fees earned, you are telling me that your sales has, you're recording a new sales or a new fees earned for this period of time. So that covers the rules for all the five families, assets, liabilities, equity, revenues, and expenses. And when you take that statement in plain English, in this case, again, coming back to our original example, purchased office supplies on account, that statement in plain English, when you convert it into the language of accounting, you would express that by saying debit office supplies $100 and credit accounts payable $100. So this statement is called a journal entry. So a journal entry is nothing but taking a statement in plain English, an accounting uh, transaction in plain English, and expressing it in the language of debits and credits. Now, where do we make this journal entry? This journal ent entry is typically recorded in the general journal. The general journal is the place where you tip typically record your journal entries. And a couple of other things you need to keep in mind about journal entries. Every journal entry must have at least one debit and one credit. As in this case, we do have one debit and one credit. Second, the journal entry must have equal dollar values of debits and equal dollar values of credits. So in this case, we have $100 of debits and $100 of credits. Later on, you'll see that there are some more complicated transactions where you could have, for instance, two debits and one credit on the same transaction. And that's fine because it still meets the test of having one debit and one credit, number one. And number two, as long as the two debits combined, the dollar value of the two debits combined should be equal to the dollar value of that one credit. So then the journal entry would still be valid as well as in balance. Okay? So that's a little bit about the rules of debits and credits. Thank you.